Welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, Getting Transparent. Real quick recap from our last show and our last podcast. We were joined by Asa Waldstein. Asa is a great guy who shared his insights into how your supplement and CBD marketing claims could be getting you in trouble if you're not paying attention and uh, how to tie those into regulations and also shared a pretty cool story about how his father inspired him to start his own business. We talked a little about getting out in nature and just had a really good time. So check it out on our last one. This week, really excited and honored to be joined by our current guest, uh, Megan Michael John. Megan's one of the leading sustainability experts in the apparel industry, currently serves as SVP at Supply Chain Innovation at the Savory Institute, previously held sustainability and transparency management roles at Ralph Lauren and Eileen Fisher, has her master's in impact-focused business and investing from Glasgow, Caledonian, and New York College, and is a Penn State grad. We are. Let's go. Yeah. So welcome, Megan. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So just kick it off a little bit. What led you to start and, and end up in the whole career in sustainability? And when was the moment that said, hey, this is a problem and I think I might want to help try to solve this issue? Yeah. That, so that moment happened um, when I was actually at Penn State. I was doing my undergrad. Oh. My, my whole thought was I was going to school to become a veterinarian. And um, two years in, I realized this isn't the best track for me. But I was pretty lucky. I took some classes um, around environmental science, especially how you know environmental issues affect uh, just people and communities, and um, and how they don't affect those communities equally. Mm -hmm. And then it was uh, Bill McDonough. He's the author of Cradle to Cradle. So I think I think most people will probably know who he is. Uh, he came to Penn State and did a talk, and I was in attendance. And that was really that was it for me. I was like, yeah, this this mm -hmm. is what I want to focus on. Um, there's so many issues around environment, whether it's climate change, pollution, you name it. Um, there's just so many systemic issues to tackle. So that's when I decided to, um, I, I changed my major, I went into environmental resource management. Hmm. And yeah, and so that was, that was, that was my path that I, that I took after college. I was really lucky that I found uh, a couple different jobs within consulting firms on right. one actually here in Pennsylvania, Sustainable Solutions Corporation. And that was that was amazing. And I was exposed to um, this whole world of corporate sustainability, mm -hmm. working with many different brands from building owners um, and um, contractors for, for new construction, as well as product manufacturers. And it was really that that product that I loved working on to find, um, you know, better materials, better solutions mm -hmm. to, um, to get, you know, just these more sustainable products out in the world. Yeah, I mean, listen, now granted, I probably wasn't paying attention in college as I should have been. I think I was more more focused on having fun, which which there's a lot of that up at Penn State. I don't recall that being much of a discussion in the 90s, even in the business classes at that point in time. So it's exciting to hear that universities and corporations are starting to pay more attention to, we need to build a sustainable planet. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's we're going to be in trouble um, for sure. Um, how did you end up in the apparel industry? And, and share some of the, like, for lack of a better term, some of the issues in the apparel industry that, that they're facing now that, that, that you are trying to solve and, and different nonprofits are trying to solve and even corporations are tackling. Yeah, yeah. I, I was definitely an outsider when I started in the fashion industry. That was in 2014. And as I was doing all this consulting work, I really loved focusing on the products and mm -hmm. I ended up doing a lot of work in green building industry, which is fascinating and awesome. Uh, but it's very focused on efficiencies and a lot of engineering work. And just my heart was in agriculture and mm -hmm. creating products using natural materials and, um, you know, sourcing them in a way that that was causing a lot less harm on the environment. I also just happened to love clothing mm -hmm. too. And I thought, wow, I would love to be working in the textile sector. Um, and I was just a very persistent young person in my career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, Eileen Fisher, it's a clothing brand based in New York City. They do women's wear um, and they mostly use natural fiber. So they were on my radar because they were known for their sustainability initiatives. And I just kept knocking on their door and met some people there and was very, very lucky. And they ended up hiring me 2014. And it was a really interesting time in fashion because sustainability was still, uh, not every major brand had a sustainability department. It was still pretty unique. Um, and even though some of these corporate sustainability departments were starting to form, 
they they were not focused on transparency mm. and especially around the supply chain mm -hmm. um so i think it was myself i okay. i was hard into why do you think that was was it just um still kind of we need to protect you know all our trade secrets and and that transparency mm -hmm. hadn't come around quite yet to a, like a marketing component and and that you're building trust with buyers and consumers what what, what do you think was the mindset around lack of transparency I think no one was just really thinking about it. It's, it's right. part of, there's a lot of systemic issues in fashion. And one is that most brands were working off this antiquated business model of relying on either their garment factory or mm -hmm. sometimes um, some brands like Eileen Fisher had very good relationships with their fabric and yarn mills. Right. But they would rely on them to source raw material, yep. of yep. course. That's Which is the same point. actually in the supplement industry too, that that the, um, you know, the, the contract manufacturers control the supply and that I, we actually have some of our, our people we've talked to that really want to get back to transparency and, and traceability all the way back to the farm, but they're, they're not big enough. They don't have enough stick or right. carrot and they're at the mercy of their contract manufacturer. And they're like, our goal is to be able to bring that in-house at some point. So it's interesting that the parallels are the same in food supplements. And I'm sure if you're a small food company and you go to contract manufacturer and they're like, we're going to, Get the best margins we can from this company. Yeah. yeah, you know that you're kind of stuck. So that's that's really interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean it, it's exactly what you just said. It's it's that's sort of what makes the whole industry operate in this in this way where it's very profitable is that you mm -hmm. rely on others to source commodity goods and they're sourcing um, when hopefully when the market is low and they're they're they have uh, that kind of secures their profit margin but they also give you those materials at scale so that the the end producer also has a healthy margin as well um, but as the pressure is put on brands especially because that's who the consumer knows when the when the pressure is put on to say you know we want more sustainable materials we want to see these um you know we, we don't want to see all this harm happening and exploitation happening in the supply chain now brands have to go and actually figure out where do their materials come that's from. right and in that process it doesn't take long until you know you either find out that it's impossible to actually trace these materials hmm. or, or if you can you may not like what you see and so why wouldn't you just go right to the source and start um, what I what I say is nominate the those materials yep. um, or producers that you want to work with. And then we have we're slowly getting to the point where we need to get there faster where we're designing our supply chains, mm -hmm. not just the product and then relying on um, the others to, to outsource materials. We really need to think about this as like a full design process. Um, so, so, yeah, I think. Um, that's one of the challenges within fashion. The other is that there's enormous pressure from the devaluation of garments. Yep. And that's really happening because the fast fashion industry has just exploded. Um, especially I think probably like late nineties, we, mm -hmm. we saw all these fast fashion companies come on the market, but it's not like we have fast fashion and then slow fashion. What it right. did is it put just pressure on the industry as a whole and their increased use of um, particularly polyester, like all mm -hmm. synthetic fibers, but mostly polyester uh, because it's made at economies of scale. It's just so cheap and it's cheapened all the clothing and the quality. And unfortunately that's trained um, really well-known brands, like some of the bigger brands that are not really considered fast fashion, mm -hmm. they have to compete with that. So yep. now they yep. have shorter production cycles, they have lesser quality. And the worst is that they're training the consumer to, you know, to, yep. to buy a lot more at a lower cost and expect those deep discounts. It's, it's really problematic because it's uh, forecasting what what someone's going to buy or what the consumer is going to buy is already pretty tricky. Mm -hmm. And now we just have massive overproduction of cheaply made goods. And it's leading to a lot of problems where, you know, we have, we have too many clothes in our closet. Um, and then there's like just seconds that it's, it's it brands, you know, they, they burn, they incinerate, they donate, but it's just this massive problem. I, I know, um, a couple of people have told me, and I know there's some articles floating around, 
just of some some photography in Chile where there's just these huge landfills of, of yep. clothing. Um, I, I think it's, it's really down in Haiti as well, right? So you Haiti. give us a couple examples of, um, I mean, not only like on one side of the supply chain, you've got landfills with, we just assume that it's apparel that it'll dissolve into the earth and that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as like to produce it, even if I guess if you're using natural fibers like cotton, where that's being um, grown and used and, and the different, um, you know, pesticides or whatever, you know, as well as the manufacturing facilities. So give us a quick highlight of some of the, the issues that occur to, to maybe some listeners that don't, don't know um, that, that the apparel in, industry and, and um, it causes, and then we can talk a little bit more about some of the fun stuff and some of the innovation we're, we're doing that you've, you've been part of and are leading to hopefully solve yeah. some of these challenges. Yeah. Well, I do think the biggest problem at the material level is all the plastics. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that natural materials, you know, get a free pass here, but with natural materials, you actually have this, this potential to create something positive in the world. They're often farmed and harvested by um, farmers, family farmers, herders around the world. And so you're supporting these local economies. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's also a toxicity issue, which with the plastics you will always have, especially at end of life, whether it's microfiber shedding um, and polluting waterways and soil and air, um, or just the fact that it is often incinerated at some point, like the, when it's sent to um, the global south, you know, from, from all these Western countries. Um, that's probably the most problematic in terms of pollution and also just production though. And that's where we see there's definitely toxicity and pollution issues in terms of tanning and dyeing, mm -hmm. uh, creating uh, viscose fiber, which comes from wood. So there's a lot of chemistry to get that, that wood fiber into something that's wearable. Hmm. Um, there's, there's issues all, all along the path, but I think uh, with natural fibers, we have just this huge potential to create something good and, and uh, restore ecosystems, draw down carbon, mm -hmm. support local economies. And it doesn't have to go through these uh, very, you know, uh, like caustic or chemically intense processes to get a t-shirt. Right. Um, yeah. So um, tell me what about, let's go back to you and your story a little bit. Um, was it, what led you, what was your upbringing and some stories that let you not only want to do big things and solve big problems, but also let's be honest, um, you've got to be pretty bold to, to do what you're doing and speak out and say, Hey, I think this whole industry is doing things the wrong way. Um, were there certain inspirations for you that kind of drove you to, um, not be afraid, um, or, or have maybe have some courage to, to, to be willing to disrupt? Yeah. Um, wow. I was expecting that question, Joe. Um, but well, so I think my upbringing actually did have um, a bit of an impact on what I'm doing now. Um, I grew up on a hobby farm, so not commercial scale at all, but uh, the fact that I was always surrounded by, by animals and I think that had played a big part because what I'm, what I'm doing now is trying to connect that agricultural piece to these fashion brands. I've always said in, mm -hmm. in so mm -hmm. many meetings on pitching strategies, we are fundamentally an agricultural based company. You know, we are right. so reliant on these natural materials. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it can be, they can be sourced in this way that's doing like really, really good in the world. Um, to be bold and outspoken, I think might just be my nature sometimes, especially <laughs> when I see that there's, yeah. when there's just like something systemically wrong, you know, mm -hmm. there, this is a very complex industry. Supply chains in general are complex. Mm -hmm. um, the fashion industry though is the supply chains are very long. It's very much based on relationships um, and a lot of expertise and knowledge along the processing uh, chain, you know, it, and I, I think it's it's such a special industry. I, I, I love it and I think it has this, this force to be really powerful. Um, especially because we all wear clothes every day and people love fashion. It's an expression of, you know, who you are and, it, and there's art involved and really, you know, and a lot of design. So it, it brings in all these, all these different disciplines. And when we see this destruction that's happening because of it, I think, I think it's just, it's, it's a little sad. And, yep. Yep. but we, we can, we can flip that. We can create this, this industry that has, that can actually have positive impacts rather than negative ones, or mm -hmm. even even if we fo not focused, we didn't focus on 
reducing those negative impacts. You know, we hear a lot of these net zero commitments mm -hmm. or how do we how do we have a lower carbon material? And that sort of drives me crazy because like, wait, no, we need to shift our mindset into this abundance mindset. We can actually help farmers be more profitable mm -hmm. and create this, mm -hmm. this thriving fertile ecosystem that actually gives abundance back to us and to local communities and the farmer themselves. So yeah, I think that's where I just, I almost see, I get, I get frustrated around the inefficiencies and the fact that we we just need to kind of rethink how we're doing business within fashion. I think that what you experienced as growing up is the interconnectedness, right? We're, we're, we, as long as we um, consider ourselves siloed or isolated and, and, and being isolated, I think, you know, the last couple of years with, with COVID is a good microcosm on the impacts of that, like personally, but realizing that, you know, 50 years ago, America felt very isolated from the rest of the world, but we're realizing that we're, we're not like everything we do has implications short term or long term with the growing global population and the interconnectedness and social media. Now we're able to see that we can't behave as consumers and individuals, especially enterprises, that um, what we do matters. And, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably assuming that you got to see it firsthand and now it has an impact, which is like, all right, now we can, can make a change. And I love the fact that you're actually helping us to, to like, let's not shoot for, um, you know, this low denominator, let's do better. Let's push it. Like let's shoot for the stars and hit the moon and, yeah. and we can, we can do that. So, so maybe talk a little bit about when you're at Eileen Fisher and some of the innovations there, what were some of your initiatives and, and, and cool projects that, that you worked on that, that had an impact? Yeah. So Eileen Fisher was just working there. I was about there for about six to seven years was incredibly pivotal in, in that mindset change that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I was focused on supply chain transparency which was amazing. It was an amazing opportunity to be empowered to go ask anyone connected to our supply chain, pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I always felt like I was just like investigating how the um, the whole industry worked and how the business worked. It was, it was very, very cool. But my background was in sustainability. And so of course I was also looking at it from that lens and figuring out how can we strategically be better about getting materials that are creating that positive impact. And I have to say, I think after years of consulting, and I was at Eileen Fisher for probably about a year or two, probably two years, um, where I was getting a little bit frustrated just with the corporate sustainability world in general. It's like, mm -hmm. why are we only, like, why aren't we shooting from the moon here? Why are there only like, you know, these lackluster solutions that don't right. really move the needle? And uh, we were tasked there um, with, with finding sustainable solutions for many materials. And then it was time to tackle wool. We had to find sustainable mm -hmm. wool. And um, we as an organization were sort of like, okay, what does that mean? What, what, like, you know, we know about animal welfare. Most merino wool is coming from Australia. Mm -hmm. There's an animal, it's actually an animal welfare practice to prevent disease called mule zane, but it's barbaric and it's really harmful. Mm -hmm. So that was on our radar. You know, we don't want that wool that's from a mule's animal. Um, but what else is there? And we did uh, a lot of basically desktop research and talked to organizations around the world who were claiming to have these responsible and sustainable wool options. And what we started to realize was that there's definitely some really unique things happening around the world, especially uh, with one organization, their name is Ovis21, down in Argentina. And they're basically claiming that they're restoring the grasslands of Patagonia. Mm. Um, because of their sheep. And we were like, oh, okay, that's, it's interesting. And we were talking to some organizations in Australia and New Zealand. And we were very lucky because um, Eileen herself at Eileen Fisher was just very supportive of us being on the ground and figuring, figuring it out for the company. So she basically said, just go, just go there. If you need to go talk to some farmers, just do whatever you need to do. So my colleagues and I went to Australia, New Zealand, and Argentina. Um, I think I was gone for over a month wow. <laughs> traveling yeah. the world. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my I life bet. because so my, our first stop was Argentina. We met with this group called Ovis 21 and we're on the land and we, they're just telling us like how, if you start to move these animals right. in a way that they would move in nature without mm -hmm. 
expansion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, they're constantly moving and they're also um, much closer together than you might see like cows as you're driving mm -hmm, down mm -hmm. the highway, you know, because there's no predators there. But in nature, there's predators and they stay together for protection. And they're always moving because they're always moving to fresh grass and then they're trampling that grass. And then sometimes they're moving really fast and when there's a predator. And that way that those animals move throughout the grasslands, that impact is what creates a healthy grassland because grasslands and these grazing animals, they co-evolve. So there's, That's right. there's this, yeah, the symbiotic relationship. And the amazing thing is that when you restore this relationship, you also see higher levels of ecosystem functioning. So you're growing more grass, you're getting more photosynthesis is happening, that you're taking more of that, that energy from the sun, it's photosynthesizing and putting, putting nutrients into the soil, like the sugars and the exudates. So you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and you're putting it into the soil, you're growing more grass. So that means you have more food for your animals. Yep, You're actually yep. literally growing the carrying capacity of the land. Water is cycling um, much better. It's infiltrating the soil. It's being held in the soil um, longer, uh, especially during drought periods. So you're more resilient during that. Mm -hmm. you stand, uh, sustain uh, any flooding conditions much better. And then you also have these minerals that are cycling too. And it's sort of this amazing way to, to regenerate or restore the grasslands. Um, when I was down there, it, it, it took me a while to understand this concept because yep. I had to relearn basically environmental science. I felt like on that trip, uh, hmm. not to say that there's anything wrong with my Penn state education, but man, it was very old school. We, we learned, you know, that it takes thousands of years for, for soil to form. I mean, it was, it, it was not progressive. Like it really should have been, um, it was also my education was very much based on this idea of you have to put things back into the soil if you take them out. So right. if you, you have animals in that land, you have to somehow get those nutrients, that nitrogen. As if oxygen. man handles everything. If it does, if it wasn't for man, it's yeah. not going to happen. Like right. there's this happened before we existed. And was it mind blowing? Do you be like, oh, my goodness, a light bulb went off. Eureka happened. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. this part of this amazing ecosystem. And if we are stewards of it rather than takers of it, then we can do something really special here. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And it's almost like we forget that nature and biology have, have they figured this out already. They figured it out a long time ago. It's beautiful. Oil yeah. rapidly. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. And the, so we, we visited several different properties down in Patagonia. Um, and that was 2016. I was I was there, and on one of the properties, um, now we were there during a drought, and this property just started, you know, doing um, holistic management, which is mm -hmm. how you get those regenerative outcomes. And there was a drought, so we were looking at a lot of indicators of soil and ecosystem degradation, and so the um, person who was taking us around was saying that you know this is what we don't want to see. This is what we're managing for to correct this. So I go down three, three years later, 2019, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm on a completely different property. Wow. There's birds, there's wildlife, we're seeing dung beetles, which is like a great sign of that, mm -hmm. that mineral mm -hmm. cycling. Um, it was, it, it sounded different. It smelled different. It was, mm. I was blown away. And that's where, you know, it, it takes, it does take a little bit of time to get that story. Um, but within those three years, it's a really short amount of time to see this thriving ecosystem from from what I saw, you know, just three years prior. That's really cool. So you guys were invested in those in order to get, um, start looking at that, like, here's where we're going to get our wool from. And this has, mm -hmm. again, it's not just about the sheep. It's not just about the farmer. It's about the whole environment, um, on, on, on that side. So that was pretty fascinating. So, um, fast forward a little bit. Now you're at the Savory Institute. Talk a little bit about the Savory Institute's mission and some, mm -hmm. um, what led you to them and some projects you're working on. Yeah, so it really was that project at Eileen Fisher when I was working on wool um, that opened my eyes and, and also introduced me to the Savory Institute. So the Savory Institute is a nonprofit and their mission is to do large scale global restoration of grasslands mm -hmm. uh, through holistic management. And the way that the Savory Institute is set up is uh, it works on this global network of hubs um, OVIS 21, the organization that I mentioned earlier, 
they're one of the savory hubs in the world. So that was the connection to savory for that project. And the reason that you have hubs, it's really, really important to have those hubs feel empowered. And, and typically the hub establishes themselves and then becomes affiliated with savory because they have that regional context. They can train farmers in their area. Um, you can't create a list of practices that will guarantee regenerative outcomes mm -hmm. and, and just say here, everyone in the world, you know, do these practices and you'll be, you'll be fine. Every single land manager has their own context that they're operating within. And a lot of that is based on, on their region. Um, so, so the hubs, they, they deploy the training, the land monitoring and mentoring and, and support resources. Um, but and so anyway, so Savory and the, the leadership of Savory has been working on holistic management and looking for those regenerative outcomes for a while now. And they've had huge success. They're seeing uh, farmers around the world grow their carrying capacity and their profitability and their resiliency. Great. And now that regenerative is becoming a bit more well known and almost the point is becoming a bit of a, a buzzword, unfortunately, but we're seeing really great demand in the marketplace. So that's where the program that I work on uh, mm -hmm. is called Land to Market. That's where that comes into play. It was developed within the Savory Institute, and it's basically connecting all the supply of these regeneratively grown materials with brands. Mm -hmm. And my role there is to work on kind of the middle of the, in the supply chain. So I'll, I'll help a brand, you know, connect them with the right producers that are meeting their material specifications, um, regionally appropriate for wherever their supply chain is, uh, meeting minimums, things like that. Mm -hmm. Is this specifically just for the apparel industry or other industries as well? Uh, food as well. So we're okay. working in fashion and textiles, um, food, and a little bit in skincare now too, some okay. based skincare brands. Yep. And um, yeah, so, you know, like I said, those, those, uh, supply chains are long and complex. So mm -hmm. that's where I come in and help kind of uh, design and like navigate these supply chains. Um, we talk a lot with, you know, tanneries, processors, uh, traders, and making sure that everyone's on board uh, and that we can actually have that flow through material into the final product so that there is a differentiated product in the market for consumers to make better decisions. What do you think is driving um, increased demand? Um, and, and maybe it's a lot of different things, whether it's consumers are waking up and asking questions, whether it's enterprises are suddenly finding their values and saying, hey, we need, maybe need to shift our values regulatory. Do you see a certain thread or primary driver that's starting to shift a focus? And, and, and you know, like it, uh, how much more work do we have to do, right? Like, is is this is there still, hey, 90% of companies still haven't even thought of this or don't care? Or where do you see the macro movement yeah. of, of um, interest in sustainability? Such a good question. I, I, I'm really, really hopeful because I think we're starting to see the consumer man, demand increase. However, the biggest gains have been at that enterprise or brand level. Mm -hmm. um, I think in order, for, pretty much all brands have to have sustainability initiatives. I, I've been really impressed with the increase in just these sustain these very robust sustainability teams um, on the on, on these companies, at least the ones that we we work with and and in my past experience, because they're taking a different attitude. It's not just okay, let's you know check the boxes to, to say that we're sustainable. We have brands coming to us saying, yeah, like, that's great. Like we'll be a member, but we want to have impact. We, we want to that's invest great. in these farmers because yep. there's a level of awareness that has increased. I've noticed in the, just the past couple of years where um, we know there's a large amount of demand out in the world for regeneratively grown materials, as well mm -hmm. as other preferred or sustainable materials, but there's not enough supply. And it's not just going to magically appear because there's demand. We, we know that. Um, organic cotton is still represents only 1% of all cotton grown annually, and it's been wow. around for decades. So it's not just demand. Um, there needs to be investment at the farm level. So we have some brands. Um, UGG, I think, has the um, is, is a great example. They have publicly committed to um, regenerating 100 um what is it? One, 1 million acres of land in Australia. Mm -hmm. 
which is fantastic. They're, they have this grant program where they're, they're uh, funding the holistic management training, as well as this um, land monitoring, which um, it's a scientific protocol that was developed by the Savory Institute with um, other partners around the world and, and some universities in the United States. It's called ecological outcome verification. And so that's what our program is fundamentally based on is that we're measuring land health. We're not saying it's regenerative because a farmer did X, Y, and Z. We're saying it's regenerative because we're proving regeneration mm -hmm. through looking at uh, ecological and biological indicators of health. And there's a cost to that. You get to send highly, highly uh, qualified people out to the land. They have to do their me measuring and monitoring. It has to go through um, a quality assurance. And so we're starting to see brands fund this monitoring as well. Um, to get those baselines and then do the um, annual follow-ups to make sure that we see those positive trends in the ecological health. Um, so that's that's really, really hopeful. I, yep. I am sometimes blown away by how many times we get asked, um, how can I invest? How can I that's great. create that supply? It's amazing, yeah. And what do you think are are some of the barriers to um, to scaling this process, right? So to where it's just, everyone does it. And, and, and it's something that scale, you know, it's going to, obviously it's not going to happen overnight. One starts with awareness and then there's education and then there's change and we're changing, um, habits that we've developed over probably the last hundred years where it's all about cost and accessibility. Now we're, we're, we're trying to change that a little bit. What do you think are the, the biggest uh, barriers to, to making this, um, a, a scalable where mm -hmm. regeneration is just what we all do? I think there's a couple different barriers and they, they happen at, at, at all levels. Um, that mindset change on doing business differently, uh, that's huge. I mean, it's hard to get people to change, right? Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. um, asking, asking a brand to start thinking not just about the cost of goods, but their environmental and social impact as well, that's a change. Um, even just asking them to have a product where they are designing those supply chains. That's also very hard because mm -hmm. now you're not only increasing the cost of goods because of that sustainability attribute or environmental asset, it's because even a processor might have to do business differently. They may have to stop production yep. to take a, a run to, that's, that's that segregated supply yep. for a brand and keep it separate from the rest of the materials so that they have that transparency and traceability intact for that brand that's a disruption. So yep. we have to figure out new and creative ways of working. But then at the farm level, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of producers will struggle with that, that change in management because their father did it a certain way and their, their grandfather and their great grandfather, you know, and they don't want to be the one who, you know, perhaps ruins the whole family business mm -hmm. because they changed the way that they were managing land. That's why we, some of these amazing stories um, that come out around regenerative agriculture is because the land manager had no other choice but to change because they had so much environmental degradation on their land. Yep, yep. And some of the, the best gains that I've seen have been in situations where, um, let's say the, the farm was... In, in a family's hands and then went down to the, the son where the those sons and daughters have felt that they're allowed to experiment. They've been mm -hmm. told explicitly mm -hmm. sometimes by the parents, like go and take this piece of land and do what you want. If you think holistic management will be better for us, go try that out. And, and allowing that experimentation to happen is super important. Yep. And, and the same thing is, you know, no one wants to be a social pariah. And so- right. Sometimes we, I, I've talked to many farmers around the world, whether it's regenerative or organic, and they'll tell me, well, I'm like the kooky organic guy, you know, here, and, and my neighbors don't quite get it. And it's so important that those, that mentorship and that community exists for people so that they have someone else that they can rely on and, you know, just try things out with and talk about what they're doing. This is one of the reasons that, that the hub structure is really important in the Savory Institute. Um, just having, just having, you know, that network of people you can connect with, um, you know, those like-minded people and we'll get there. I mean, there's still a lot of land managers who do not want to change, but it's pretty difficult not to see the change um, or change, see the difference between 
conventionally managed land. And then when your neighbor is doing regenerative and their grass is, you know, waist high, that's and right. their soil on the conventional side, it's hard not to see that that's, it's, you know, that's, it's a better way to go in, in most scenarios. Then you get the kind of fear missing out component, but I imagine, which is a, how do we reduce risk for whether it's at the farm level or at the manufacturing level um, through organizations like Savory Institute or, or enterprises coming in and funding things and educating, uh, you know, it's always good when, like you said, you've got four farms, one of them is doing things the right way and they can see the difference, but also they're recognized for that difference. And then they're like, oh yeah, my profits are better this year than ever. Like, oh, okay, bingo. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to, to change that to a large degree and getting stories told. I mean, to be honest with you, it's, it's, um, you talk about change in any in environment, whether it's, it's, you know, internal in an organization or even in a family or, you know, we're implementing or, or talking about traceability software solutions and, and it's the same challenge, right? So finding companies that are willing to take a risk and it starts with a lot of the values you're talking about, which is we want to track things back to the farm. And in order to do this, we need X and then they embrace it. And then you can start to educate and talk to other people about making those changes. It just, it, it just takes time for sure till mm -hmm. hopefully it becomes standard. So hopefully this regenerative farming and, and uh, materials practices that we're using in apparel and, and you're working on in, in our foods and supplements is just something that we do in the next 50 years would, would be amazing. And, and to be part of that is pretty cool. So one last question before we get to something I call the transparent 10. Um, my daughters love to go thrifting. And as a dad, I love to take them thrifting because I can be the benevolent king and say, get whatever you want right of thrift <laughs> store. Right. And okay. I can feel like where if they want to bring me to, to like Lord and Taylor, I'll be like, you've got a budget of X. Mm -hmm. So that's one example. I think there's been a shift in, in the younger cultures. What are other things that we as consumers can be aware of and look for? What can we do as people who have our life to run every day? to be aware to have an impact in some of the worlds you're living in? Yeah, I, I think the answer to this question will, will vary for each individual. And just like brands, individuals, we have our own set of values. And I think it's important to, to live by your own set of values and, and your own context and your circumstances. So I, I can just say from, from you know being someone who really loves fashion and clothing, um, what, I, what I tend to do is I pretty much only buy natural fibers mm -hmm. as, as much as possible. So and that's cottons, like, wools, anything that's not, um, pro cause I, listen, I'm, I'm a, like a middle-aged guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't pay a ton of attention other than it's pragmatic, right? Is this going to keep me warm? And is it yeah. going to like my, this is like my standard outfit, blue shirt and jeans. So talk, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, yeah, for me, I, I, I tend to, I'm kind of a wool nerd. Like I mm -hmm. love wool, um, and anything, um, you know, just going back to what we do at the Savory Institute, like we're using animals as a tool to create regenerative ecosystems. I think animals really like they're the unsung heroes. They're the, what's actually going to, uh, you know, restore the planet um through proper management and mm -hmm. that can only happen if we hold the value within those within those fibers so mm -hmm. i personally like to buy and wear wool all the time hmm. and other animal fibers uh, especially from herding animals or uh, grazing animals like so i think there's nothing wrong with leather especially if um it's meeting your values around the the processing so i'll look for veg tan um and, um, you know, if, if I can, local is also a really great to support your local um, agricultural, you know, um, you know, just your local farmers. Um, alpaca, cashmere, mm -hmm. well, cashmere has some issues, but that's a whole other podcast. But um, <laughs> yeah, and I think the thrifting is great. It, it's, yeah. it's excellent. It's not going to solve this big fashion right. crisis that we're in, but I think it's really great. And, and it puts some more pressure on the those larger brands to stop producing so much. We have to get to a point where right. we're producing what is needed and that it is of, of high quality to, to purchase. Um, yeah, there's just too many uh, cheap clothing in the world. So I guess that's kind of what it is. It, it's buy less, buy better if you can. Keep um, it longer, right? Yeah, for keep me, it longer. I can, I can wear it till, and, till it's worn out. So, and that's not going to yeah. work for everyone. Like, you know, yeah, everyone has their it. own context. I don't want to make anyone feel bad. Um, but 
it's also not on the consumers. And I feel really passionate about that. It is not mm. our fault that fashion companies are overproducing. And then we start seeing these, these landfills filled with textiles around the world. That That is a systemic issue that the brands have to fix. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, listen, most consumers don't know, right? Like I had no idea until I watched that documentary a couple of years ago on the apparel industry and fashion industry. I was like, oh the my goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the true cost. It was really impactful and, and, and changed my, my thought process around it. Um, and in the same way that we, we change our mind about food and healthy foods and where our foods come from and, and how it impacts our health. But to your point, which is a, the people who are in that world, they know, they know the impact and, and, and have, and can have an immediate um, change right away. Now as consumers, now that I know, kind of like now I'm also partly responsible too. And so I think that that's where we can all work on this a little bit together. And if we're choosing brands and, and companies that are doing things the right way, then guess what? Then their revenues are going up, their margins are better. They're going to be able to scale better. And then, then the companies that aren't may have to take it, take a look at that yeah. as well. So exactly, exactly. And so, yeah, I think the natural fibers is amazing. I try not to buy things that even a synthetic blend, um, and that's really hard to do if, if for, um, active wear, yep. but, um, <laughs> and, but I also have to plug, you know, if you're in the grocery store and you see that land to market seal on some meat products, I, I mean, that's also a really good way to support regenerative producers around the world, because they're the ones that are doing all that hard work of managing the land in a way that they're seeing those positive outcomes. Love it. So the next session is, is, is our fun part. Megan, where we just get to nervous. fire some questions at you. If you haven't watched any of the podcast podcast yet, it, it's um, it's fun. We call it the Transparent Ten. I'll throw a question at you. You give an answer as quickly as you can, and that's pretty much it. And then we get to know you a little bit better. So you ready? Okay. All right. Okay. So what what's your most proud achievement? Oh, um, the, it was the wool story. Getting that wool from Patagonia into Eileen Fisher sweaters. I love it. Uh, something you love to do. Uh, rock climb. Ooh, nice. Something you hate to do. Um, uh, right. Guilty pleasure. Chocolate. Mm, good one. Favorite band. Favorite band. Um, oh gosh, I have no idea. Florence and the Machine. All right. Favorite movie. You yeah, like you asked him with a question like I know. Like yes, you got it right. Hundred dollars. <laughs> Favorite movie. Casablanca. Favorite vacation. Uh. Hmm. The Adirondacks. Something you suck at in business. Oh, um, <laughs> something I suck at in, oh, selling. Something you're great at. at in business. Um, I don't know. Um, strategy development. <laughs> It's like, let me throw some big words again. This sounds good. Yeah, I, I get it. I get, I get an idea that dressing down all your suppliers pretty well and, and, and researching those is something as well. So yeah. what's your big vision for the fashion industry? My big vision is that the fashion industry becomes a force of good. And I mean that by they're supporting producer, land managers and producers around the world, whether it's a farmer, a herder, um, you know, crop agriculture, whatever it is that they're supporting people um, in doing that in a, in a non-toxic way and providing high quality garments of value to consumers. Love it. Megan, thank you so much for your time today. This was great educational fun and um, learned a lot about you and your story. So just keep grinding away. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me. You bet. Stay transparent, everybody.